Okay, I, I think I, I think this is a good time to sort of get into it. All right, so um, the Kiryu duology, um, I will say it's definitely one of the stronger sets of movies in the millennium era. Um, obviously, GMK is the still the best. There's a <laughs> there's not even there's not even a question there, but um, yeah, like Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla. Pretty strong story, I would say, as far as like involving the character of Akane. Um, she's, um, she's a really good character. I definitely think that she is one of the strongest examples of a, of a good human protagonist in a Godzilla movie. Um, you know, definitely a pretty good story there. Um, and as far as like, you know, it, it definitely delivers on the action, for sure, delivers on the goods. Uh, but it is definitely more of a character story. It's more story driven than action driven. Whereas Tokyo SOS is definitely more act, it seems like a lot more action driven. Um, which, you know, it, it, Tokyo SOS certainly delivers on the action. There's no doubt there. And it's, I would say it's pretty damn satisfying action. I will for sure. But, um, yeah, uh, I will say Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla is definitely one of, is pretty much the better of the two in terms of, you know, writing quality. Um, cause, uh, you know, I mean, as we'll sort of progress, or at least, uh, the series we will progress, um, the writing, you know, it's, there's like, there may be like some questionable stuff in Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla in terms of like some bits of world building here and there. Mainly involving the continuity to the 1954 film, which it had to like retcon in order to get to where we would have the Godzilla bones being used for Kiryu. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I I mean, I kind of understand the intent there to kind of they retcon it to where they could have the story, but um, you know, it's not like it's the worst thing in the world, but you know, it's. It is noticeable, and uh, um, hold on a sec. I think uh, just to double check because I have uh, the movies here, so I can uh, you know to kind of use as reference points. I think I think there may be something about uh, like how the movie ties in with the uh, moth it, it, like. Mothra 1961, you know, and that's obviously, it's even before Tokyo SOS, they reference, do, do, they directly reference that movie in it. And uh, then you got, uh, and you got the reference to War of the Gargantuas, like they show stuff for the Jagaira tearing stuff up, but then they, but they pretty much like retell events about how Gyra was defeated by Mazer Tech or something like that. Um, you know, War of the Gurkic was that doesn't happen. <laughs> That's like just like I was defeated in a completely different way. And there and there is even a mention of Sando, so that's so we'll we'll just have to chalk it up to them just using footage from that movie because you know, it's kinda like the quick and easy way to showcase the events which they're narrating. Um But yeah, um, and then you get to Tokyo SOS, which makes the more direct connection to Mothra, the, the 61 film. And then, you know, because you got like a Shujo um, and his, uh, his nephew, I think, um, who is the mechanic. And... Uh, <clears throat> There's definitely some uh, some tad bit things there to go over. Let me just put on a sec. Hold on. Hmm. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, give me a second. Here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Uh, all right. 
right, just, all right I'm, I'm trying to pull up Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla here because uh, I you know watched it a couple nights ago and last night Tokyo SOS. So here we go. And yeah, of course, there's the obvious question of like where where were the Shobajin, you know, the twins? In the oh, hello, fresh to match. How you doing? Yeah, and there, okay, where was I? Yeah, and there's the obvious uh, thing with the Shobajins, like showing up in Tokyo SOS to warn Shujo about the bones of the original Godzilla will be used for Kiryu and how it's kind of wrong and that the bones need to be put back into the sea. And they show up in 2004, which is where Tokyo, when Tokyo SOS takes place. It's very interesting that that, that is the case when there were, when like, if there's like a five year gap between when those bones were retrieved and when we get to Tokyo SOS, and Mechagodzilla was completed in 2003, which is when the main events of Godzilla against Mechagodzilla take place. So you had like four years where they're working on Mechagodzilla, and you had like a whole year between the events of GAM and Tokyo SOS, and they just don't really show up there. What do we discuss it right now? Uh, we're kind of talking about like the uh, continuity of the the of Godzilla against Godzilla in Tokyo SOS. Uh, the point that I just stem just going on right now is about the fairy, the twins, kind of kind of showing up in Tokyo SOS, and there isn't really much of an explanation for why they didn't why they never showed up in the previous film if they had such if them and Mothra had such an issue with um, Japan using the bones of the original Godzilla to use for Kiryu. Um, I'm even trying to pull up Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla, but, you know, <laughs> you know it's kind of going to take it a bit here, a bit of time here. Because uh, there's like a, some, you know, uh, a little bit of conduit in there as well that I want to address. It mainly involving the original Mothra, or you know, have those two movies sort of tie in with it. Uh, 45 years ago, first got to appear, it was Tokyo, and there, and Serizawa uses Oxygen Destroyer. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, all right, so. So yeah, they kind of retcon uh, the ending of Fifty Four because the bones appeared because the bone because Godzilla's reduced to bones by the Oxygen Destroyer and then and uh and there, in fact the movie even kind of showed it disappeared a little bit but then um but then next thing you know like you know the, you know following it the bones are like shown to still be around. Again, I know that they want to have it. They want to have the plot sort of happen, but it is still, it's kind of a thing to, to kind of note a little bit, especially if it's with But anyways, we'll keep it going. There we go. Just... Yeah, they keep getting invaded by other monsters. Like Mothra, here we go. Okay. Okay. All right. So I, I just kind of was playing through that. So I don't know if anyone was able to catch that, but basically they went over like in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. They, you have like this sort of scene of exposition where they establish like that Japan is like being attacked by monsters, not just, you know, since 1954. And, uh, 
Even before the disintegration, the book 1954 bones look different. Um, yeah, that yeah, that's kind of the um, yeah, like in like between the original film and Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, like you got like the practical effects with the bones um, in '54 before they disappear, and then you got the CGI model that's used for Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. And yeah, they, they, yeah, they definitely look pretty different. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but <laughs> good point. Yeah. Um, so since 1954, they step, you know, after they retrieved the bones, or not, oh no, they didn't retrieve the bones. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, then you had Mothra show up, and they show footage from the original Mothra from 1961, and they pretty much established that they destroyed Mothra which does not line up with Tokyo SOS whatsoever when that movie is meant to establish that that is it, it's supposed to be a continuation of sorts from the original Mothra. Where in the original Mothra, Mothra was never destroyed. She pretty much was able to return home after she, the Shobajin were brought back to her. So that's... That's a it's a big error on Tokyo SOS's part, right there. Um, so yeah, that's 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 lovely. Yeah, you you gotta love huge gaps in continuity there. Yeah, that's that's fun. <laughs> but yeah, so. Anywho, we first got that. Wanted to get that out of the way. Um, and yeah, and then there's the, and then there's like that vial of Godzilla DNA that was said to have been retrieved in March 11, 2003. Now, if we could actually, now actually, if I could pull the movie up again, I think there might even be a date um, shown. You know, when, you know, that takes place during the opening scene for Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Um, even though, though it is just a design change, it's pretty annoying since you can't hand wave a corpse with healing mutation. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a thing. Yeah, <laughs> it pretty much is. Uh, that is true. That is true. Um, anyways, and now, and pretty much, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla pretty much established that there wasn't there wasn't really a Godzilla attack since 1954. There were kaiju that showed up, like Mothra and Gaira, but they didn't say anything about another Godzilla showing up until 1999, which is basically the the opening scene of Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. So we might actually be able to pull a date. Let's see if there's a date here, just so we can uh, give it a second. Just going through the movie here. Uh, see if this, see where it is. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah. Hold on, I'll. Uh, gets this comment here. I just want I need to find, I'm trying to find something in Godzilla against Micro Godzilla just so it's the lineup. So, give me a second. Just got to let it play out on mute here. Just wait. Okay, 1999 AD. So, um, as Zimzilla said in his like a stream, the stream that I was on with him a couple of nights ago, what his streams. That there was like an error about how the original Godzilla, how uh, Godzilla, the Godzilla that we see in this duology, showed up like in 1999, or, or he pretty much said that it took that he was like arrived like before like the po the point where he pretty much you know arrived before that. Well, actually, it, okay, hold on, <laughs> bear with me a second. My mind's like. <laughs> Okay, so there. So the post-credit scene for Tokyo SOS 
there is a vial of Godzilla DNA, and it's dated to be from March 11th, 1999. It does kind of line up a little bit, more or less, that they would, you know, in terms of like, yes, his return was in 1999. Yeah, uh, I actually pulled up the movie on my laptop just to verify it, pretty much. It was 1999. 1999 AD. Um, it didn't say it specifically March 11th, but like the vial was labeled as, but in Tokyo SOS, but yeah, it is, that does kind of more or less line up the quick, it's just the question of like, were they able to retrieve like that, some speck of Godzilla DNA, like after that, like after that first attack and they kept it in that vial the whole time, like I could say it could be possible. Yep. It was. Yeah, I'm just kind of going out of order. Was Mothra killed in the Tokyo SOS backstory? I always thought that was the 1961 Mothra, just older. Uh, no, Mothra, no, Mothra pretty much in the 1961 movie was never killed at the end of that movie. Um, but in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, they established the backstory that she was killed, um, but then if that the military did defeat her, the problem, though, is that once you get into Tokyo SOS, and it's meant to be like a direct sequel to Godzilla, to, to Mothra 1961, because you got Shujo, um, and they specifically reference events in that movie that played out, and they even said that Mothra, that he, that uh, the fairies were taken by some bad people, and Shujo and some people, people who he was with got them back and stopped her and he even shows pictures of like the uh the symbol that they made on the ground to kind of quell mothra to kind of to kind of like tell her to chill out pretty much and uh say like hey here's your twins so that just leaves the question like if tokyo sos is supposed to be a sequel to godzilla against mecha godzilla then you know, then it would have to, like, acknowledge, it, like, the Tokyo SOS pretty much shouldn't have tried to tie so explicitly to Mothra 61, you know, if Godzilla against Mech, or GAM, Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla established that Mothra was killed by the military in 61. So, yeah, that's, so I think, and as far as like whether or not that, yeah, it's so yeah, like the Mothra, according to Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla's backstory, Mothra was killed, but then Tokyo SOS like retconned it to where it was, it's more in line with the original Mothra's events, where Mothra lives to the end of that movie. And I don't think they ever mentioned Mothra being defeated in GXM. Uh, they did actually. Um, they basically they basically said we we destroyed her. And that they they pretty much so yeah. Oh uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's free. It's kind of fun to kind of go through some of this like continuity stuff. It's almost like. It, it kind of reminds me of like the Fox X-Men movies at a certain extent where even like some of the best ones have some, you know, have like points where they sort of contradict the continuity of others when they're supposed to be like, like kind of more, they're supposed to more or less fit together, right? Like for instance, like, like you guys know how in a, uh, X-Men The Last Stand, uh, there was like a very minor character who was like almost background named Boulevard Task. Uh, not Boulevard Task, Boulevard Trask, the guy who would go on to create the Sentinels. Um, but, you know, and let's just say in Days of Future Past, he's he appears again, but he's played by Peter Dinklage, even though in X-Men The Last Stand, He's played by an actor who looks nothing like Peter Dinklage, like whatsoever. So, I mean, but that's like that's kind of minor. You, know, you could say that's pretty minor in, in comparison. 
to be to be fair. Um, but a more significant example would be how is like how confusing it is for Jean Grey to use what is essentially the Phoenix Force if, at the end of X Men Apocalypse to defeat Apocalypse, only to then later on have Dark Phoenix come in the movie come in. And she she just has the Phoenix Force, or she gets it, as if she didn't already have it. It's weird. <laughs> they just said the weapons used evolved into the Mazer Cannons IRC. Actor changes are a constant in superhero movies, though, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so all right, so let's kind of get to the, all right. So let's uh, try to move into the next thing there, um, just so we can kind of move things along a little bit. Um, so yeah, uh, Akane, really good character in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Um, haven't you know she pretty much blames herself for uh, essentially like getting her comrades killed by accident. The weapons quote was referring to Mothra and GAM. Well, yeah, even if the weapons were evolved, you know, into the Mazer cannons that we would see, you know, be like the ones being shot at in, in against Gyra um, in that stock footage, in that backstory, um, they the thing GAM still says that Mothra was killed when again, when again, Tokyo SOS direct is like. It's meant to, Tokyo SOS kind of like references the original Mothra as if it played out exactly like how it played out in that movie. So, so that's, anyways, anyways, let's, uh, I want to try to get, try to fix the lark here. <laughs> um, so I, I would say, like, yeah, pretty much I, like, I definitely agree with the references there. Like, I definitely see them there, you know, like, and I definitely, you know, because I, you know, I even pulled the pulled the movie up there, but yeah, but Jack, yeah, for which one of us agree? Uh, yeah, Akane, really good character. Um, she, you know, has a really strong uh, arc in the film of trying to find value within herself when, you know, you know, when other, you know, because everyone else pretty much considers her to be valuable, pretty much. The way they just nuked Akane from the story was heinous. Yeah, Tokyo SOS really just major, major missed opportunity to you know, to have Akane like complete her, like just sort of conclude her story with Kiryu. Like you could say, like the most like meaningful arc that she had that she could have had already occurred in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, where she finds value within herself, and so she kind of like. You know, puts her essentially metaphorically speaking, not literally, like puts her soul into Kiryu. <laughs> Let's just say metaphorically. I want to make that clear, figuratively. Um, but yeah, like it would have been really nice if instead of Shujo's nephew, the mechanic, being the guy that bids farewell to Kiryu at the end of Tokyo SOS. You know, as they're both, as him and Godzilla are taken out to sea, it would have been real. It would have been so much better if it was Akane in that position. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a big mistake on Tokyo SOS's part. Um, like Shujo's nephew, like he's not, he's not a terrible protagonist. It's just like he's fine, but. 
there's just not much to him to be if i'm being quite honest the old like really the most notable thing about him is that he's the nephew of a character from and from like one of the older showa movies um or at least one of the showa movies that this conduit the kiryu duology is even connected to they're just they're, yeah like shujo uh, mechan mr little mr mechanic shujo is just kind of he is not equal to akane <laughs> akane really should have been in tokyo sos as opposed to and, here, and yeah, here's the thing for ST Bash. It's not that they nuked Akane from the story. They pretty much, it's almost like they fridged her, more or less. Like, they're just like, oh, hey, here's Akane, you know, the main character from the previous film. We could do something pretty meaningful with her, but nope, let's just throw her in there. Bringing in Chujo from Mothra but not the main character from the last film was absurd. Well, here's the thing. They did bring Akane in in Tokyo SOS, but she only has a bit role. It's a role. It's not even, it's only slightly above a cameo, like her role in Tokyo SOS. It's just, it's bizarre. It is really bizarre. Yeah, they gave her a tech desk job. Um, well, they gave her a desk job in Godzilla Gets Back to Godzilla, but she built herself back up. She pretty much, like, kind of, um, they, they sent her off to do further training in the, to the U.S., apparently. Which was, frankly, worse. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, her getting a desk job in Godzilla Gets Back to Godzilla, you know, while she's still the main character, you know, it... It, it kind of makes sense because of the fact that she did she made a big mistake that cost uh, cost the, the lives of a bunch of good men um, to the lives of Godzilla to, to Godzilla pretty much in that opening and so she kind of like you know feels you know, pretty much blames herself but she tries to build but she's like building herself back up to try to you know to try to move forward but of course it's like not really like but she she definitely has ways to go because she doesn't even find value in herself. Like she finds more value in others than herself, and that's something that's been going on her whole life. Um, and which makes it all the more meaningful when you got characters, you know, just being like you know, like uh, Sarah, uh, who has like this story involving her and her father losing her mother and her unborn brother. Um, they're pretty much, you know, it really adds a lot. I forgot. I thought they just sent her to another desk job. No, not really. Um, I mean, why would they, here's the thing, why would they send her to a desk job if she actually helped repel Godzilla? If she was, like, the key person to help Kiryu repel Godzilla out of Japan, out of Shinagawa at the end of that first movie. Like, if anything, she probably would have gotten a medal for it. <laughs> for, like, basically showing, like, if it bleeds, we can kill him. <laughs> you know, considering that big gap in his Godzilla's chest at the end. You know, it's... I you have that. But, yeah, like, she might as well have gotten another desk job in Tokyo as was, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, it was like a... Uh, like, as like a monster action movie, Tokyo... I, I consider Tokyo SOS to be pretty satisfying. Like, the action, the monster action is pretty top-notch, I would say. And I'll say Godzilla in Tokyo SOS... Has a has more character to him than in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla because Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, um, he uh, oh, so. yeah, U.S. training is much better. Um, yeah, but yeah, but it's just that it takes her out of the movie entirely. It just writes her out of the movie entirely. So that's um, so you can take that as you will, I suppose. Probably a loss more than anything. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, as far as, like, characterization goes, uh, Godzilla in the Kiryu duology, like, 
there isn't much to really write home about him in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. He's just like, there isn't really, like, he just kind of shows up as just Attack of Japan. There's not really much of a reason why he's doing it. Um, and he's just kind of there to give, you know, to essentially give Akane and cure, uh, an outlet to, you know, to basically overcome her, uh, you know, her, her eternal conflict and to, to combat, uh, to help herself, like, help, help herself be empowered to, uh, you know, to, to go forward pretty much and to give, as well as to give Kiryu and the JSDF, you know, big scary monster to fight. But meanwhile, Tokyo SOS comes along and Godzilla is being drawn to where Mecha Godzilla is, who is being rebuilt. And obviously Godzilla showing up to Japan would be a bad thing because of the amount of destruction he causes, whether he's looking for Mecha Godzilla or not. So, yeah, Tokyo SOS, he has, like, a lot more characterization to him. And uh, when he's, like, being, you know, you know, when he's being dealt, like, serious injuries by Mechagodzilla, like, uh, like when Mechagodzilla stabs him, pretty much. And, uh, and uh, like, you actually kind of feel a, little, feel a little bit bad for Godzilla, pretty much. But, uh... Yeah, and then Kiryu kind of like, you know, starts going rogue like he did in the first movie. You know, and takes himself and Godzilla back out to sea because they basically both like belong together. <laughs> so they belong, or as like, as the Frankenstein puts it at the end there, the Bride of Frankenstein, we belong dead. <laughs> but uh, not in a uh, sense of like, oh, I'm taking you out, you out with me. It's just more like, come on, brother, let's let's go home. That's it's a pretty interesting sort of thing going on there. Um, like, there's pretty much some hints of like the the sort of gray area in terms of using Mechagodzilla. Like, obviously, Japan needs something to defend themselves against something like Godzilla. That's that's for sure. You know, but there is like this gray area of like what are the risk the risk factor of it all. Um and obviously they didn't consider the risk factor of Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla until Kiryu goes on to go rogue after it's being reminded of uh of who he once was, which was the fifty four Goji. Very well on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, and you and so it's not until like that scene where Kiryu goes rogue in GAM where they pretty much are like, oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just yeah, there oh yeah, there is definitely a risk factor, and they and they basically and I definitely appreciate that they're like it's a decision that to let send Kiryu back out to fight Godzilla again. It's a decision that's not made lightly, pretty much in GAM. But they know it's like, what are options do we have at this moment? And then Tokyo SOS kind of comes along and kind of tries to, you know, further elaborate on this notion, continue that. But, you know, you know, it, it, you know especially with the Shobajin, but yeah, again, there's the, the questionable continuity stuff there that, you know, that kind of gets in the way of that. So, anyways, you have got that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I will say um, there's definitely some conveniences, you know, here and there, and that in a, during the second half, as great as the action is, pretty much, you know, pretty much in a kaiju spectacle type of way. Um, there's definitely some luck or un or bad luck happening. Like, oh, that's pretty, uh, it's pretty convenient for the, uh, you know, that the, uh, that, that, the uh, Shujo and, uh, his, uh, grandson, they basically are just a-okay from rubble, pretty much like that. I mean, which, 
I mean, which, I mean, I'm, I'm okay. Like, that one I don't have much of an issue with. I guess, like, it's entirely possible for something like that to happen. But the other thing, but the, the bad luck factor is when, like, Godzilla, like, shoots at Kiryu um, as he's trying to get up, and it causes, like, like that door that Shujo got in from, got into Kiryu from to repair him, you know, is, like, kind of burnt up, is, like, melt, mold, melted, like, shut, so he won't be able to get out. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a bit unlucky. Like, Godzilla easily could have hit him anywhere else. <laughs> that's, hmm. So, there's, no, there, there is some of that, but it's not like, it's not like a huge deal breaker or anything, but it's, you know, like what I just brought up there, but it is just kind of like, huh, okay. <laughs> I guess we're having, I guess that happens. I mean, I guess it can happen, but, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. I don't really have a whole lot else to say about that. <laughs> um, what else? What else is there? I will say, um, like, I was confused at first about why the Shobajin, you know, were suddenly like there to help Chujo, you know, but then I realized, oh yeah, they probably, you know, the, the Mothra larva, the, the twin larvae, you know, they probably, uh, you know, came in, came in with them pretty much. Kind of like how they came in with, Mo came to Chujo's place with uh, their mother pretty much. So, which which makes sense. Sorry, did I miss anything? Um, uh, not much. Um, I will. Uh, I'm just. I am just kind of pointing out right now that um, <laughs> that think it's that's kind of funny that you know it's like the the Tokyo SOS actually does address like that the Shobajin actually do kind of need Mothra or. Her, or even her children, her larvae, in order to be able to get around to places, um, as opposed to something like Godzilla and Mothra, the Battle for Earth, they're just like, you know, <laughs> like, like they just don't, they're just not with Mothra at all. They just like choose not to go with Mothra, even though it would be so advantageous of them. Uh, but it's it's funny, <laughs> kind of interesting. I was kind of, you know, I will say, I was kind of confused about why, how the Shobajin, like, were able to show up to Chujo, you know, when he's, like, trying to find his backpack, uh, to, when he's, like, trying to make his way to get to Mechagodzilla. They, like, they lift the bag up. They telekinetically lift the bag up from the rubble. Um, and then they sort of, sort of lead him. They, they, they kind of more or less lead him to get to his, uh, his uncle and his nephew. As well as to find that bag, and and where to get to Mechagodzilla when the tunnel was like kind of you know buried in rubble, um or blocked off, and then I realized oh wait yeah they're they're with the Mothra larvae, so, so yeah they they can get around. <laughs> it's like if they're near Mothra and they pretty much have a reason to go with Mothra or her children. They would. They would stick with them, as opposed to Godzilla and Mothra, the battle for Earth, where they had several opportunities to literally fly to Mothra, before, you know, at any point, especially, you know, if it means getting back home. But no, they have to get kidnapped and potentially let Mothra kill a whole bunch of people in Godzilla and Mothra, the battle for Earth, the Heisei film from the 90s. Um, Tokyo, I will say, I definitely appreciate that Tokyo SOS did not do the whole, like, rehashing of the plot from Mothra 61, where the fairies get kidnapped by some evil capitalists or something, and, uh, you pretty much got that. Like, I just want to say, like, you know, despite the questionable continuity to the original Mothra, Tokyo SOS still handled the Shobajin slash Cosmos slash twin fairies slash Mothra's uh, twin girl 
you know, twin native girls, pretty much. You know, Toko SOS handled them much better, or the lore behind them. I will say, despite the questionable continuity, they're handled better in Tokyo SOS. Can we discuss the fate of the Absolute Zero canon? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we could probably talk about anything that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, any, uh, if there's anything you want to bring to the ring about it, uh, you can. Um, cause, uh, I would say, yeah, it, it's kind of weird that they were, yeah, like the, the, abs the absolute zero cannon. Yeah, that thing, it was like a beast and a half as far as like weapons go. And here's the thing. Well, I pretty much, I, I understand that, you know, considering that, like, the end of Godzilla against Mechagodzilla takes place, like, in, like, mid-2003, and then you get to, you flash forward to Tokyo SOS, and the main battle takes place, like, in February or even March of 2004. Like, they probably didn't even have, like, like, even with all the, t with that much time, considering that we are dealing with a giant mech, pretty much, and, you know, and they have to, like, make technology, with the technology that they have to deal with and try to implement it all, like, it'd be understandable why they were, in, like, I think in Tokyo SOS, they said they couldn't find any synthetic diamonds, or they couldn't find a sufficient amount, and so they stuck with, like, the Hyper Maser Cannon, which is, like, this ultra, this huge maser cannon that's in Mechagodzilla's chest that's in addition with the maser cannon that's in his mouth. Um, I, I don't really have much of an issue with uh, the fact that the uh, Absolute Zero, um, I don't really have much of an issue with the Absolute Zero cannon not coming back in Tokyo SOS, um, you know. I'm really mixed on it. I get it was impractical, but just a big maser is so lame. Um, well, here's, a, I mean, give, consider, I, even though it is, may seem somewhat impractical, like, in, in a sci-fi story or a sci-fi based story, you can, like, you can kind of make it to where, like, you can take something that may seem impractical in real life and sort of make it possible if you give it, like, a good explanation. Um, and from what I can recall, I, I would say Godzilla against Mechagodzilla does a fair job at that, um, at introducing the Absolute Zero. Um, so to have Tokyo SOS kind of established that they weren't able to get the Absolute Zero ready, and the fact that, you know, it's only a matter of time before Godzilla, like, were to reappear, like, they were kind of, like, on a... They were basically on a ticking clock, and the clock isn't even all that clear because Godzilla could easily just show up any day. So having the the uh, the the triple Maser, the hyper Maser, it actually like I I could I could accept that I could excuse that. I will say they they do at least make up for it by having Mechagodzilla's arm be you know like his right arm just kind of be you know, modded into becoming, like, a blade, pretty much, that he could just stab Godzilla with. And I think he even drilled into him, like, just kind of mess him up. And so he uses that triple mate, the hyper maser, in order to blast into that, you know, into that wound. You know, basically just unload on him, on the Godzilla, and just really do some serious damage internally with him. Um... I pretty much get what you mean. That it may that may not be like the most satisfying thing, but I I don't know. I don't really have that much of an issue with. I think it checks out fine. Um, for me at least. But uh, yeah, there 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 it is. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely some things in Tokyo SOS that are kind of disappointing, but not really. But not, but it's not like it's so crippling, I would say. Um, aside from the um, Akane being underutilized and kind of being fringed in Tokyo SOS, that's the only, uh, that's really the only, like, that's like probably the biggest blunder of the movie still. <laughs>
It's almost like they. It's interesting that they had it. Like at least they, she didn't like die in a helicopter crash. You know, like a certain character did in a certain sequel to a certain beloved kaiju film. You know, I mean, I don't know. Let's just say like Mako from Pacific Rim dying in a helicopter crash in Pacific Rim Uprising. Akane easily could have. That could have been Akane dying in that. Could have been so much worse. <laughs> we, could, we could have had so, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, it sucks that Akane had limited screen time, but if it was made today, or if it was made like like years like years later, like five year five years ago, five or six years ago, that's probably what would have happened to her. <laughs> like, can you imagine that? <sighs> Civil Rim Uprising is so stupid. <laughs> Those are great points. However, it would be so cool if his chest unloaded a gun that shoots grenades or a rod from God Launcher or something. Um, yeah, that yeah, that could that actually could work. Yeah, you know, like him using like like him use like after he makes like the big wound in Godzilla, then he just like shoots like a bunch of grenades into that wound, and then you know just like puts a you know does that as well. Um, yeah, I I could see that 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 could work. You know, here's the thing. I honestly thought, I pretty much honestly thought into like it was a while since I'd even seen Tokyo SOS. I mean, like I've watched. Yeah, you know, watching it after, but I want—I mean, I watched it last night, obviously, for this, uh, you know, the prep, pretty much, as well as Godzilla against Vector Godzilla. But I honestly thought, I thought for a while, and this was probably because I have, and I guess it's a testament to how kind of forgettable, like, Chujo, the mechanic, was was in Tokyo SOS or is in Tokyo SOS. Like, I honestly thought Hayama was the main protagonist in. Um, to Tokyo SOS, like the guy who had like the biggest issues with Akane being a pilot in Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. I honestly thought he was the protagonist <laughs> for a while. I thought so, but uh, apparently not. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's another thing. It would have been interesting. That would have been kind of interesting. Like he would be able to find, you know, would kind of. Had something going on there in Tokyo West West that continues after the events. Like, oh, dude, even better. Him and Akane being like, you know, in Tokyo West West. Like, Akane doesn't even, like, Akane wouldn't necessarily need to be a main character in Tokyo West West, but she could at least be like a part of that battle. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Oh well, yeah. So yeah, uh, long story short, uh, Godzilla against American Godzilla is definitely better in terms of writing. So I'm thinking of talking about it more, because I'm talking about it and Tokyo SOS more. Um, so there's there's that. Um, not to say that either the that either one of those move these movies are perfect, but Godzilla against American Godzilla is certainly better. Um, from a writing standpoint, as far as like in an action standpoint, uh, both movies are really well done. Like technically, in the technical side of things, they're both pretty well done. But I I could definitely see people enjoying Tokyo SOS more for the action. Sometimes it's difficult to tell which character in a story is the protag, even when the story is great. Um. I'm not exact. I I'm not exactly. Sh I guess it would have to be a case by case. Um, I guess it would have to be a case by case basis, pretty much. It just kind of depends on like which one would like who 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 has like the most focus that would in the story that would have because protagonist that would it also comes with the notion of it being the main character the character whom we're following for the majority of the story if not all of it um that's usually what it is it's a like protagonist um 
So that's usually, at least that's the most clinical like way to describe a protagonist. But yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I can I can definitely understand uh, people enjoying Tokyo SOS more for the for the action that kind of happens in the second half with with it being an all out monster battle royale, which is very it's definitely very well done on the technical side of things and and as far as it being the conclusion to the Kiryu duology, it is kind of a fitting conclusion. It's just that there's yeah, there's definitely details in the plot that. I would change. I would have liked to have seen changed, you know, to make because it could be so much better. Let's just say. Um, again, switching Chujo out as the main character for Akane again. <laughs> that would that would be that be a start. Um, so of course you got that, or even just have Ch maybe or even have like Chujo with her. I don't even I don't know like it. There's avenues that could have been. There's ways that it could have been done. We can. It's like we can make this better. It's not bad, you know. It, it foundationally speaking, but it can be. It can be improved. We have the technology. We don't need to do a full rewrite of everything. We just gotta rework to maybe just like rearrange some stuff and tweak some stuff here and there, so that we can make it. <laughs> so that we can get, get this, you know. Whereas Godzilla against Mechagodzilla uh, definitely, you know, has significantly less plot issues, um, for sure, and it has less contradictory contradictions in its world building and continuity because of it being like, you know, being the first of the duology, so it doesn't really have a whole lot like to like it, it had some baggage, but not like a lot. 